started. All right, guys, um, this is the next talk for today. It's application modernization with Camel JavaScript and OpenShift by Sam and Wuxing Zeng. They aren't here. Um, I don't think they're joining us today, but feel free to drop any Q and A in the section, and we will share them with. Uh, we'll share them offline. All right, enjoy. Hi, everyone. Our talk is on application modernization with Camel JavaScript and OpenShift. My name is Wu Xin Zhang. I am an associate consultant at Red Hat, and my co-pilot of my presentation is Deep Sam, who is an architect. Um, at Red Hat. So application modernization. There are five parts to application modernization. For a service endpoint, we migrate web services to APIs. For architecture migration uh, modernization, we want to break down monolith into standalone microservices because they are easier to maintain and to share the code. To modernize development process, we want to modernize waterfall approach to CICD so that you can release on a daily basis, like agile transformation. And for deployment, we want to modernize virtual machine on-prem to containerize images. And lastly, for infrastructure, we want to move data center to cloud. Integration points. Before, on the left-hand side, um, we have a big cluster of dependencies. It's hard to cut out a piece of the application to modernize, because in order to modernize an application, you also need to identify the dependencies to modernize at the same time. And now we have um, this graph on the right-hand side that shows once you have an application to modernize, you can create clusters of dependencies, meaning we are breaking down the dependencies into smaller multiple clusters. So instead of having one giant cluster depending on each other, uh, we have small clusters of dependencies. And doing so, we can maintain low risks. So Camel, what is Apache Camel? Apache Camel is an upstream project that we use for integration technology at Red Hat. Apache Camel is Java-based, based on enterprise integration patterns. Apache Camel started its life as an implementation of the Enterprise Integration Patterns book. It comes with 300 components out of the box you can use. Integration can range from simple timer to lock dummy examples to complex processing workflows connecting several external systems. Camel has built-in data transformation, intuitive routing, and provides native REST support. Integration patterns. As developers, we know that the more your application is deconstructed into smaller pieces, the more you need um, better communication pat patterns for managing all the inherent complexity. Camel has been shaped around enterprise integration patterns since its inception, and developers have created a um, DSL that often maps patterns in a one-to-one -one relationship. These patterns are agnostic of programming language, platform, architecture, and provide a universal language, notation, and fundamental messaging and integration. Camel continues to evolve and adding new patterns from service-oriented architecture, microservices, cloud-native, and serverless. Camel has become a general pattern-based integration framework suitable for multiple architecture. I am not exaggerating if I state that Camel DSL is the language of enterprise, enterprise integration pattern. It's a language that expresses better than most of the patterns that were present in the original book of integration with other patterns that have been added by the community during all these years. And the community keeps adding patterns and new components in every release. In this slide, you can see that we have a split orders pattern 
that splits the order from a larger order and have each item be sent to either electronics or other areas. Apache Camel is a powerful integration library that provides lots of integration connectors. As you can see, there are hundreds of Java libraries that used Camel connectors using uh, this Camel endpoint notations. These URIs are also universal. Here are more examples of Camel, Camel components. You can Google Camel components and you will find a lot of them. Camel routes. So like I said before, Camel has multiple domain specific language for DSL. It supports XML, Java, Groovy, Kotlin, and of course, JavaScript. There are good reasons to use both Java and XML DSL. Camel route expresses the enterprise integration patterns. It gets the developers into thinking in terms of pipes and filters, for instance. The DSL is a technicality that will not impact the success of the project. You can even mix and match. So in this slide, you see that this is a one-to-one -one integration between a file and the JMS queue. At runtime, it does not matter for Camel whether you write it in XML or Java. So more examples. Here from a file called Inbox, we split the body based on its line. For each of the lines, we turn it into a custom XML. And for each of the XMLs, we send it to an active MQ called an active MQ called line. Integrations are great for connecting systems, data transformations, as well as creating new microservices. REST DSL. Camel also offers a REST styled DSL, which can be used with Java or XML. The point here is for end users to define REST services using a REST style with verbs like get, post, delete, and etc. The REST DSL supports the XML DSL using either Spring or Blueprint. Here, to define a say path, we can set the base path in REST say and then provide the URI template in the verbs. It also accepts data format setting. OK, uh, let's talk about Camel JavaScript. In this sample, we use JavaScript function to create a predicate in a message filter. The message filter is enterprise integration pattern. It allows you to filter the messages, obviously. For example, if the predicate is true, the message will be routed from QA to QB. This route path routes exchanges from a main user to a special queue. We can write this in Spring DSL as well. Here's another example of Camel JavaScript. As you can see, the integration written in JavaScript is very similar to a Java one. Here, from the timer tick, process the function that prints hello camelk to log info. To run it, you just have to execute camel run and the name of the file. For JavaScript integrations, CamelK does not yet have an enhanced DSL that you can access to some global bounded objects. In this sample, we're using context.get component of the previous log component and use exchange formatter property to do something like this. Camel script context. Uh, JSR223 let you use the power and the flexibility of scripting languages like Ruby, Groovy, and Python on the Java platform. Camel supports a number of scripting languages which are used to create an expression or predicate via JSR223, which is a standard part of Java 6. Camel script context is extremely useful when you need to invo invoke some logic that are not in Java code, such as JavaScript, Groovy, or any other languages. Properties is the attribute of Camel script context. As you can see here, before Camel 2.9, 2 
If you need to use the properties component from a script to look up property placeholders, it is a bit cumbersome to do so. However, since Camel 2.9, you can now use the properties function and, this, and the example is much simpler. Here in this example, function with a resolve method makes it easier to use Camel properties component from scripts. You can also load scripts from external resources. You can do so by referring to external script files. For example, to load a Groovy script from the class path, you need to prefix the value with resource as shown. Camel dependencies. To use scripting languages in your Camel routes, you need to add a dependency on Camel script, which integrates the JSR223 scripting engine. Here, if you use Maven, you could just add the following to your palm.xml file, substitu substituting the version number for the latest and greatest release, and you can see the download page for the latest versions. So with the introduction of Camel and how Camel supports JavaScript, let's talk about CamelK. CamelK is a deep Kubernetes integration for Camel. CamelK runs natively in the cloud on OpenShift. CamelK is designed for serverless and microservice tech architectures. For those who are not familiar with CamelK, CamelK is the sub-project of Apache Camel with the target of building a lightweight runtime for running integration code directly on cloud platforms like Kubernetes and Red Hat OpenShift. So we learned that Camel is a Swiss knife of integration. Camel K is for serverless Camel for Kubernetes and native. And we also have Camel Corcus, which runs on top of Corcus and enables developers to write small, fast Java applications. We also have Camel Carafe, Camel Spring Boot, and Camel Kafka connectors. These are all the Apache Camel 3 projects. So Apache Camel K configuration. In order to run Camel K, um, you'll need access to a Kubernetes or OpenShift environment. However, Camel K works best when it's run natively on Knative. Knative is a simple pre-built component to publish and subscribe from the event mesh. Let's take a look at the performance of Camel K. Camel K runtime provides significant performance optimizations. This graph is, shows the performance of Camel K without utilizing Knative and serverless technologies. Compared to binary source to image deployment, Camel K has lower deploy and redeploy, redeploy time. If the binary runs remotely, it is even slower. Notice that the re redeploy with Camel K is almost instantaneous. So how does Camel K work? Well, developers just want to deal with the business logic and not deal with the runtimes at all. They want to integrate systems and become serverless. What they can do is to write Camel routes in a single file. For example, here we have a Camel route written in XML. And how does it work with OpenShift and Kubernetes piece? Well, at this point with Camel K, you only have an integration file. This file um, is says from some sort of timer every second, route ID, set a header, and send it and log it. So once we have a cluster prepared, and the operator installed in the current namespace, then we can say camel run with a K. Camel K comes with a command line tool called camel with a K. So camel run, and you can do camel run and then the name of the file. The CLI can automate the tasks on the developer's machine, such as observing code changes, streaming those to the Kubernetes cluster, printing the logs from the running pods, and et cetera. Note that you don't have to specify any dependency specification in the folder that you wrote your integration.groovy file because Camel K will figure that out for you and then inject it during the build. So all you need to do is just write the application. In this case, 
the camel binary will push it to the cluster and the operator will do all the tedious footworks for you. At first, at your first, um, the first time you run your application, it might take up to two minutes to start since it needs to pull and build the image for the first time, but the next build will only take a few seconds. Once it's started, you can find the pod running this application on OpenShift. Here's what the pod looks like on the OpenShift console. The pod runs in the cluster. This can also be done with OpenShift CLI tools as well. Once logged into the OpenShift cluster, the CamelK CLI will then use that to run the integration on the OpenShift cluster in this project and deploy it from here. So next, let's talk about how to deploy JavaScript on OpenShift. Uh, so the deployment for OpenShift is based on uh, containerized images. Um, so the first step is to identify and find the base image for your JavaScript application. You could find it from the Docker Hub or Quay.io or GCR.io. Right. So, so the image needs to match your specific JavaScript version. And once you have the image, you could start working on your Docker file. Um, and, and then with the Docker file, you could do the Docker command to build the uh, application image. Basically, this is an S2I process that will uh, merge your code from your Git repository with the base image that generate a new uh, application image for deployment. So this is the um, high-level architecture of how the um, deployment work with uh, the camel, camel K application. Uh, on your on the left side on the box, you have your local machine, your dev environment, you have your IDE, um, and once your coding is completed, you do the you use the camel CLI command to uh, execute uh, the 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 program. What it does is it does do a live update to um, to basically trigger and send an update to the cloud on the right hand side. It will trigger a notification to the Camel K operator in OpenShift. The, op the operator will get notified and then deploy the latest change to the pod based on the integration definition. Whereas the surface architecture is autonomous, it's loosely coupled, right? In the modern days, people have talked more about microservices. Um, the idea is that we want to make the microservices single cup, single responsibility, single purpose, stateless, right? All these specific uh, um, application program state will be moved away from the microservices and kept in some sort of persistent volume claim or databases, right? Each microservice is independently scalable and they could also be independently automated. And then on the far right hand side, we have serverless architecture, right? Serverless is based on single action, right? And this is also temporary. So when we talk about Camel K, K native profile, um, so this is an example of a workflow. On the left hand side, you have some sort of, um, you know, Camel definition. Um, you see from, um, to, from the form attribute, you see that this is getting the information from the k-native na uh, channel, and then the two attribute saying that uh, it get the information from k-native channel, and send the information to the uh, specific HTTP my host API path. This is a very simple um, uh, camel definition. You put this into a uh, uh, YAML file, right? This MO file has an integration as a kind, right? The API version is using uh, camel.apache.org version one uh, alpha. And this is an example of a YAML file for deployment in OpenShift, right? So once you set up the uh, YAML file, all you need to do is to pass this along to the CamelK operator. When the CamelK operator got notified, the operator will look at the file and make a decision. Is it a k-native profile? Right. If this is yes, this is a k-native profile, then it will generate a new YAML file, set the kind to surface, and then um, use that new file for deployment. Right. 
if this is not a k-native profile, right? In this case, this is just a deployment object, right? Then it will generate the new deployment kind YAML file based on the information and use that for deployment. Yeah. So this is a high level architecture of how the CamelK operator would work. Serverless and K-native. Um, so now it's really important to understand how we could apply K-native to serverless. Um, serverless is basically is an execution model where the code is executed by a dynamically allocated resources. When you have the code available, it trigger a notification and the resources got spin up to execute a specific piece of code, right? Serverless removed the, the need of traditional um, uh, deployment model, right? You know, the traditional way is you always need to have some sort of server component that will deploy to handle the specific deployment, but serverless took, took away that concept, right? Everything is on demand, right? Knative is an open source Kubernetes-based platform to help you deploy and manage serverless workload. So between um, when we talk about Knative, we need to define the, the different component, the building blocks of Knative, right, for the serverless application. So Knative contains two pieces, uh, serving and eventing, right? Serving is based on your service object. Um, it could scale to zero when I don't need you to, to use the surface, right? Or it could scale up to as many instances as it need when, when, when you have a peak at the traffic, right? And, and this is the surface model is a request-driven uh, compute uh, model. When I need it, I will ask for it. And when I don't need it, I will scale to zero. Eventing is based on the event binding, right? When you have a specific event come in, right? Uh, usually a lot of time is coming from a messaging queue, right? The queue come in and say, hey, you know, we need to uh, do this specific operation, right? At, and when that event comes in, Knative will spin up the resources required to do the computation for the event, right? So each building block is a crop operation, right? With a controller and that manage the life cycle. So in uh, Knative serving, for example, uh, we have a camel um, a script coming in while it's doing a rest call, doing a post to a specific path. And then you have two, right, two system one, two system two. So basically, in, in when this script comes in, you create a Kubernetes namespace. Inside the namespace, you have the, um, the Knative service that was spin up, right? There's no container if no one is using it, right? So, so this is all on demand. Serverless also help you reduce the operational cost, right? Uh, it's much faster deployment to the market. Uh, it help you reduce packaging deployment complexity. And then at the end, right, is a flexible, scalable on-demand solution. And you can see this um, chart on the left and on the right, right? The left side show a traditional IT organization, um, how much they were overpaying Right, majority of the time on the yellow line, right? Um, your your demand is on the red line, but you were uh, you need to basically have a twenty percent, thirty percent margin to make sure that you cover the demand. When there's a peak on the day of Thanksgiving, right? You are not able to meet the demand, right? So this is a, this is a traditional problem of predicting the usages and and computational resources that a lot of IT department were having difficulty. Um, can OK stay between um, microservices and serverless, right? It, underneath that, you have Quarkus, right? Quarkus is also an important component. Um, that is also kind of between microservices and serverless. And Knative is completely serverless, right? Um, and then you have streaming, AMQ, messaging queue. Those are working, you know, could be both microservices and serverless. And then underneath that, we have OpenShift. So the event-driven um, uh, uh, computation is happening between the messaging queue, Knative, uh, Camel, and Quarkus. For uh, microservices, uh, we want to ensure that the services are, have granularity and security. Uh, for distributed integration, right, we want to be able to uh, set up different containers when, right, when we discover services available, the container got spin up, Right, 
And then at the same time, you have container that coming on on the other side of the picture where um, you, you need to tra uh, track the API transaction management using Saga, right? Um, and, and, and you can see why right, this container uh, application architecture could get very, very complicated because you have you could have container in different size of the architecture diagram. And then at the end, right, they all need to communicate to some sort of centralized databases on the right-hand side. Um, so, so when this type of distribution uh, application comes in, right, so what are the best practices to handle this, right? Yeah, so here we talk about a Saga pattern that we use um, heavily for application modernization, right? Uh, the Saga pattern work like this, right? You have multiple surface services. You have surface one, surface two, surface three, and surface four, right? Each surface has its own uh, compensation uh, object associated with the, with the surface. So what happens is when you have surface one, making a call to surface two, right? And then uh, when surface two make, make the call back to surface one, and then you need to make the call to surface three and then come back, right? Each each step, the compensation um, object will get notified, right? In that situation, uh, it could um, basically hand, um, based, based, based on the request and response, uh, it could make a decision, right? Should it continue making call uh, in the orchestration surface orchestration, or should it go back, return the return the call back to the caller and do something else, right? So this is a very useful saga pattern that um, that can help handle surface orchestration. You can see we can uh, set up a, a, a set of uh, integration point between the saga and the camel, right? And and the first saga is basically saying that I I'm making a pop propagation um, to to us, uh, to the to to the to to the uh, make to make the service call, and this is a mandatory uh, uh, propagation, right? And then in the compensation model, um, you can say direct cancel booking, right? So this is my compensation model, and then to right specify where this is coming to. This come to a specific SQL database, and it is doing a insert into the flight table with the specific value, right? So you, you you can see yeah, Saga can be set up in a way that it you know in a camo camo format where you can um, uh, you know specify the the uh, the source the destination the condition right and and what to do to handle specific uh, except exception right uh, so the lower section of the Saga is the same thing as well we set up the header this is HTTP header is a post. And then you're posting the two requests to uh, HTTP endpoint. So for the source to image deployment, right, you usually get the code from the Git repository. Um, and then from there, we, um, as soon as the code got pushed, we push to the port. Uh, we, we merge the code with the base image and generate an application image for deployment. So uh, the configuration injection is a common pattern where we can inject the specific uh, um, configuration during the deployment. So for example, in OpenShift, we have the config map. Config map is an object that hold key value pairs. Um, so when we deploy the application for application one, it pull the information from the config map. Um, um, and use that information for deployment for application one. And similarly, application two follow the, follow the same design pattern. Um, OpenShift operator uh, contain uh, an example of the Red Hat OpenShift serverless. And once serverless is, uh, is clicked on, you can go here and specify if you want to do a basic install. Um, if you want, uh, you can specify specific version, right? For example, I want to do a version 4.6 for the operator, for the OpenShift serverless. Once it's installed, you can see that um, the, the install operator is in your screen here. In conclusion, CamelK is a lightweight integration framework that runs natively on OpenShift. CamelK is also designed for serverless and microservices architecture. The Knative Egg component for deploying, running, managing serverless cloud-native application in OpenShift. The serverless cloud computing model uh, lead to an increase in developer productivity, 
reliability in the cloud deployment and reduce operational cost. CamelK and uh, Knative provide a fast and scalable solution for application modernization, architecture, and Camel integrate, integrate with different technology, different languages with reliable results. We are coming from Red Hat Consultant team. If you guys have any specific question, please reach out to uh, Red Hat Consultant. Okay, that was the uh, end of that talk. If you have any questions, um, you will share them with the speakers offline. There will be a 30 minute break now and I recommend you guys go check out the live tour of Boston happening on the stage. And uh, we will see you in 30 minutes. Take care.